Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to welcome Willie McStay to a State of Mind studios. Willie, welcome. What do you think of the place? Oh, it's unbelievable. Uh, coming in here, I've, I've, I've sat for a, and stood for about half an hour looking at all the pictures, jerseys. Uh, like, it's absolutely fantastic, honestly. It's like a museum. You can spend hours in here. I know, and we have this jersey here because it was uh, the last jersey worn by Paul, your brother, and just behind you, one of your nephew's jerseys as well, Chris McStay. The name McStay runs in the family, Willie. It runs in the Celtic family. Um, but so does Sligo. If you go right back to the beginnings, Andrew Kieran's brother, Walfred, mm. from Sligo. Um, and we're nearing the club's birthday this weekend. And we're still talking about Sligo. And we'll get to that because you're going to do something very special to raise cash. But let's talk about another Sligo man in Sean Fallon and how pivotal he was to your football career and your Celtic career. Um, what was uh, your first experience with Sean? Uh, first experience with Sean, uh, personally, was uh, the day he walked down our path uh, in Lark Hall, Three Cameron Path. Uh, that was uh, where we stayed. Uh, I was due, uh, or we as a family were due uh, to have guests coming, but it was not as forest. They were coming to the door at six o'clock and uh, my mum getting ready, you know, the sandwiches and as you do, like, you no, know, uh, making people welcome. And uh, I seen figures coming. I looked out the window, seen figures coming down the path. And uh, it was Sean Fallon and David McParlin coming into the house. So uh, the way it worked out, like, uh, they came in and offered me the sign, sign with Celtic. And it was just a surreal moment. But the irony of it was that when Sean and uh, David went out the door. The Knox Forest <laughs> contingent came in and uh, they knew uh, that if Celtic did come for us, come knocking, that there was only one place I was wanting to go. But I must admit, like, Forest were... Well, there was a lot of clubs at that time. You know, I played in the Scottish Schoolboys, uh, captained the team, and uh, at that time there was a lot of interest. But Forest was the one that was very homely and uh, you know, that was the one I, I chose to go to until that moment that they walked down the the, the pathway and uh, my father got a, 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 a letter, a really nice letter from Brian Clough to actually say that, that we knew if Celtic came in that we'd lose them and wished us all the best and all that. So that was the first uh, meeting with him and he's a inspiring person. Mm -hmm. That, the Irish accent and the way he talks, you know, like, like uh, the passion about him as well, uh, just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and then what happened after that was like, you no, know, through uh, going through my career, uh, you move in to Celtic Park at that time, and I was moving in a period where Sean and David McParland were taking over. We, but we obviously must have seen uh, not being able to do it, and then the transition to. Uh, no, another legend, Billy McNeil, at that time, and I think Packy was coming in at that time as well. So it was a great, a great time to join Celtic, and uh, you no know, people that were your heroes, and you're you're working there beside them. So it was a uh, very daunting but special. Mm. See, when I, I look at the the next name in history, the Celtic, the fabric of Celtic, your great uncles, um, both captained and one of them managed the club. How much of a celebration was it when you finally signed, though, Willie? Because your family heritage was all around Celtic, you know. Uh, Willie McStay and um, his brother Jimmy McStay, who he handed the captain's armband to, mm. had captained Celtic. And then Jimmy went on to manage the club. You then signed for the club. I mean, it must have been a massive, massive celebration in the McStay household. It would be, and obviously for my father as well. Like, uh, you know, three of us ended up... Uh, been Celtic, you know, professional players, uh, but it was my dad that told us all the stories, you know, of uh, the old days and Napier. Uh, actually, in his eulogy, I spoke about that as well because uh, nobody would know. Like, Seamill was uh, the home of Celtic, you no, know, in terms of preparing for European ties, uh, cup finals, and whatever. But not many would know that actually they actually went out to Netherburn a little village outside Lat no it's Latcall, Ashgill, then Netherburn and that's where they'd done their pre season training. No and that's where no, my dad was born mm -hmm. uh, out in that, that area. So it just shows you like no from uh, Willie and Jimmy coming from that area, uh, 
been actually picked up for Celtic in the first place, mm-hmm. and then bringing Celtic to Netherburn, it's a it's unbelievable. No, if you've ever been there, uh, I think there was one pitch, but they get peace, they get away from the away from the city uh, mm-hmm. to do their to do their work. So long connections, uh, yeah, and like we when we look back, um, myself, Paul, and Raymond about you know, what Jimmy and Willie you know, achieved at Celtic, you no. Know, there is a bit of you saying, I wonder if I could do that. Mm-hmm. I wonder if I could play with Celtic. And uh, for my father, like, no, he actually was a fantastic footballer himself. Uh, he played with St. Rocks and won the Scottish Juniors. He had uh, trials with Partick Thistle and, and Celtic offered him the trials as well. But what he did was he played for Partick against Celtic and Celtic over overran them. And that was his trial kind of wasted. Uh, and I can only thank him when he kind of looked as if his football career was uh, dipping. Uh, he took us, started boys clubs and looked after us and just shaped us through like uh, schools football, uh, boys club football. And uh, he was a coach uh, and he only done that probably because we were his boys and he mm-hmm. wanted the best for him. So without him, uh, uh, no, doing that, no, where would we, we have been as well. Uh, and uh, out with that, the other thing we thank him for was taking us to watch Celtic all the time. No, going in the lap call supporters bus and it was just uh, fantastic. You're playing football and the next thing you were jumping on the bus to go and watch Celtic. So, yeah, from Jimmy and Willie all the way through, we've been steeped in that, that tradition. Uh, but again, I uh, have a lot to thank him for. It's incredible when you you look at the traditions and then both yourself and Paul represent the club. Your younger brother Raymond's at the club uh, as well. There's a great picture of him and Paul when they're playing together for the reserves. I think Paul was coming back from injury. Um, And there's moments, you know, where you both score against Rangers. You (laughs) both win the Scottish Cup in 1985. You know, you're part of that team that wins the league at at Love Street. Um, I mean, they're they're glorious memories, almost like a fairy tale, Willie. Yeah, it's like... uh, to make a debut, uh, Paul was a, a special player, and he he was always going through early, uh, and that was a challenge for me. Can I can I get into the first team? But uh, the the first game against Rangers at Celtic Park, uh, the two of us you know, were standing there in the picture in the background of the jungle jam packed, and I just still look at it just now and go, wow, like no, you done that. Uh, but in the game, like uh, we got a win. Uh, I think Alan McCoy scored in fifty eight. Uh, second something like that right away and went on to win the game 2-1 and no that was my first old firm game uh, which was special but the one you mentioned like scoring scoring the goals uh, like that that was one that's uh, like I didn't score many goals <laughs> if you know what I mean uh, so Paul scored the first one I get the second one and David Proven scored the, the third one and a wee bit of me was saying, I wish you didn't score that one. So as the headlines like would have been up, oh, the McStays beat Rangers. <laughs> that, that was a dream, no. Uh, but uh, that was special. Uh, then went on to you know, the the cup final, as you mentioned, uh, two brothers winning winning the Scottish Cup. So it was a uh, great times, uh, and a lot of good players you no know, passed through the club at that time. You no know, David Proven, mm-hmm. and Danny McGray, and Tommy Burns, like Roy Aiken. It was a really good uh, like a spell to be at Celtic, and I think going back, back you're talking about the good, you know, the, the happy moments and whatever, but the rapid Vienna game, uh, that always sticks in my mind because we won that game and uh, we should have went through and it could have been a chance to you know, get to a European final at that time. And the following year we're handicapped again with the, the ban, uh, you know, it's Atletico Madrid mm-hmm. playing there uh, no, without no fans went over there and got a draw but we lost the game at Celtic Park now, if you can imagine that being 70,000 at that time supporters cheering us on like we might have turned that one as well but that was uh, great memories and uh, the way down was that that group of players I thought we could have done something that year Yeah, you know when we talk about it it's kind of relevant just now because last season we couldn't get to the games really mm. We try, as Celtic fans, um, we pride ourselves on being the 12th man, on being able to make that difference. And we, we hear about the traditions of the European games under the lights. 
How important is it for a player? Because you just mentioned a, a, an event there where Celtic had to play in front of no fans behind closed doors yeah. and we didn't perform that day. You've seen it yourself back in the 80s. Was that a big, a big part of last season, do you think? I think so, yeah. I think when I, when I look back in their career, like you no, know, the one thing you do is you get the vibe from the support. You no, know, within the lines, like you no, know, your focus and what you what you're trying to do, and like you no, know, the team, the way the team flows, that type of thing, your individual performance. But you get a vibe from the crowd. Uh, even going back to the the '85 Cup final, you know, the United are one up, and you're going into the last 20 minutes, and that road went up on it, like in the, the main stand where it, it meets the corner of the Rangers end the road went up and it went right round the stadium and it seemed to kick us on mm-hmm. you know, it was like this is, this is it you've got to go for it now and the, that, that roar and the positivity of the crowd and sometimes the roar can be to push you on you not know, to like, you know, use that term kick, kick you up the backside you know, and uh, it's a uh, it is, a, it is a big thing in the game, you know, the crowd, and it's the vibe, you feel the vibe, uh, if it's positive or they're trying to carry you that extra bit, and that wasn't there last year. And I think uh, everybody loves you know, the atmosphere at Celtic Park, and, and really at any other stadium, you know, that's, that's the way it should be. Uh, it was surreal last year, uh, I don't think it helped us. Uh, what it does is, it inspires players, mm. but the crowd can always uh, create pressure. And if the players not get that mentality, you no, know, like their performance can drop. And I think uh, last year we, our players missed it, and a wee bit the Rangers players who weren't handling the pressure before that pressure wasn't on them, yeah. so they were playing a wee bit more relaxed than what they would have. So it was a big part of it, definitely. You know when you. You have the fairy tale. You were destined to play for Celtic, and you did, and you had successes at Celtic. You've then carved your career elsewhere, down south. Mm. At what point do you decide, Willie? I'm wanting coach. I want to move into the management side of things. Yeah, I've always been uh, involved in that, even when I was playing uh, at Celtic. Uh, but then when you move, I was probably like uh, I'm not say the youngest, but one of the youngest that went through. No, the A and B license while I was still playing, uh, especially down at uh, at Notts uh, Notts County uh, at that time. And by the time I came to uh, Kilmarnock, I'd already got all the qualifications that you could. And to be fair, that was a springboard for uh, Sligo Rovers to approach Kilmarnock for us to go mm-hmm. to Sligo Rovers. Uh, they looked at who had just uh, passed the the license and we're looking for something different, a player manager and uh, from that situation there uh, I went over and ended up you know, the interviews and like you no know, different things that you do uh, in preparation to take the job and we decided yeah we're going to go for it. Uh, so yeah I've always I've always been looking that way, you know, like, you, know, you, you reach your level as a, as a footballer but inside your head, like you know the game, and you're always looking at, at that as well. So, like, no, you were. I always thought, at that stage, like, I didn't want to leave football. Mm-hmm. What am I going to do? Uh, and made the decision, like, to do as much as I can uh, in the latter years. And uh, I'm glad I did because it's uh, you talk about achievements, winning the cup, winning the league, scoring against Rangers, that type of thing for the day of. I left school at 16, mm-hmm. I'm still full-time in football and there's not many people who can say that. So that I always say that that's probably my biggest achievement. No, to You've got a big birthday coming up, will you? I don't talk about <laughs> that one, but uh, yeah, uh, time flies by. Yeah. Uh, but to so be in the game football. that long, yeah. you know, no, you're doing uh, something right. Uh, not just right, but we're going to talk about one of your biggest successes. Celtic, they're in your blood. You're born into a family um, who have that that Celtic tradition there already. But Sligo's there as well. So we know that Brother Walfred was a Sligonian. Yep. The man who walked down your path that day came from Sligo and Sean Fallon. Yep. And then all of a sudden Sligo are interested in taking you over there. Um, you were telling me beforehand as well that your your wife's family are from Sligo. Yeah. So that connection is there. Did you seek some kind of advice from Sean at that moment? Yeah. Well, you were talking about uh, preparing for after playing the game. Uh, so 
having that uh, certificate behind you, the array license and, and whatever, like I get asked to go over, but uh, to meet them, uh, good people. Uh, I came back and I phoned uh, Sean and uh, asking for a bit of advice and the background and, and that type of thing. And they said, look, you've done your qualifications, but managing is it's for real. No, you have to go all in. I, I remember him saying that. You have to go all in. If you're going to go for it, bring over your family. And in his Irish accent, be one of the people. Because in, in Sligo, they respect hard work, honesty, and if you go and do that, you'll be a success, that type of thing. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Took the job, uh, went over there, my wife Mary, and uh, we went over there. We got a, a house uh, near the race course, and uh, the kids went to school. You know, and I know my, my, jo my, my oldest son, John, like, you no, know, school was a problem because, like, you no, know, they were talking like Irish, you know, they, they did their lessons and all that and he never forgives me for that. He says that was the worst part of ever being in Sligo trying to, he says it was hard enough uh, trying to do English without <laughs> doing the Irish section. So, uh, but it worked out, worked out really well. It was tough at the beginning. Uh, I, w I went into a, a situation which wasn't the situation that I was, the environment that I was used to and we changed it round and uh, brought some young boys over from Scotland. Uh, the best local players, uh, Gavin Dyke's been the captain as well. Uh, actually, Packy Boner's brother was in, in the squad as well, but then through work commitments had to go away uh, and you know, uh, do what he had to do for his family. Uh, it was too much travel for him. So we had good people there uh, and it just gelled. Mm -hmm. and the momentum built, the crowd came out and it was amazing. You know, we actually had Celtic over at one, one stage as well. Uh, Celtic won one nil. Rudy Vata scored an offside goal. I never <laughs> forgive the Wellington <laughs> for that one. I was up remonstrating with him. Uh, but what an occasion it was. Uh, Celtic fans, uh, Sligo fans, and some of them are both, if, if you know what I mean. We had a big dinner dance as well. So we made good funds from that. And uh, it's a memorable uh, no, a memory that I'll always cherish as well. Uh, you know that Paul been there and like you no know, playing against him and coming over there. Yeah. But mm -hmm. The most important thing was uh, like you no, know, the crowd got behind everybody and the advice that Sean gave us actually you no know, materialised. Mm -hmm. you no, know, the hard work and they supported the team. They supported me as a manager mm -hmm. as well, and I'm just so proud that we we did what we did. You no. Know, a unique treble, which, uh, as you say, like uh, it's, it's, it's hard to win one trophy, trophy, but uh, to win the three, and going looking back, uh, the connection again with Celtic. No, so that's the success at uh, Sligo Rovers. We played Derry City in the cup final, Lansdowne Road, uh, and win it, mm -hmm. uh, which what a, a special occasion that was. The party. Uh, down in Dublin and then the bus is coming back up through the counties and as soon as we crossed the Shannon like the, every town was the bonfires and stopping the bus they wanted to get the bus out in their town and in the local pub and all that it's the longest journey ever from Dublin that anybody's ever made but a special one and by the time we got to Sligo the, the whole county was as if it was in the town centre thousands and thousands of people uh, lining from the the top of Sligo all the way down into the you know, in, into the river. Uh, special times. Uh, it was great. It was great. And uh, going back, that achievement. I didn't know that there was a special guy in the stand. Uh, he just been told he was getting the Celtic job, so you know who it was, uh, Tommy Burns. But I didn't know he was there. And uh, a couple of weeks later, he phoned and uh, said, look, how would you like to come back to Celtic? And I thought, well, what's, what's going to happen here? And uh, I had to speak to the club and he spoke to the club and uh, it was a, a difficult decision because you're a manager and you know what is it Tommy's going to offer? Mm -hmm. So I went over and like, hey, has Tommy done, got you feeling good about yourself and the passion that he puts across? He says, look, we need to shake up the youth 
system. I want you to come and manage it. And uh, after thinking about it, like, no, you're saying uh, it was tough because we'd got to uh, side went to Europe. Yeah. And I thought, like, the family, they've sacrificed for me. Uh, that's another step in stone. It's going to be an education for us in terms of me learning the game, you no, know, at, at a higher level again. Uh, but Tommy being Tommy, uh, agreed to sign mm -hmm. uh, and I signed a three year contract and I was sent to earlier I ended up 16 and a half year what I was doing I loved it mm -hmm. uh, and what you, you did was uh, with the parents the players that you signed you were like you, know, you were taking their boy and, and asking them to sign with Celtic and mm -hmm. we'll do our best for them and uh, I'm just glad that it was a, a, a big success you know, a lot of players went through and played the first team and you can see John Kennedy and Steve McManus now part of the management team, yeah. uh, team and uh, that's when I'm, I feel old you know, they used to be my youth players and I signed them at 14 and what were so but that's a cycle uh, and that's the beauty of being in that part of football uh, it's about developing and uh, you just try to take every player to their level mm -hmm. you know, that level might be somewhere else but you're always hoping that as a coach that you get the best out of them and took them to, to their peak uh, and we've, got, we've had a, a big success on that. You know, a couple of things about that, your move back would it only have been for Celtic and only for Tommy Burns at that point, Willie? Because I mean, the success that you I had, can, you're, uh, you're up to look forward well, to. I can honestly say that uh, I don't think it would have went anywhere else for that type of role. Mm -hmm. It was Celtic, it was Tommy, it was new. Uh, the other thing, uh, I think the first year was uh, Hamden, yeah. uh, the home, not for the first team. And, and what I was doing is uh, I was in the dressing room, you not know, as a member of staff, and you're, you're listening to team talks, you're listening to tactical changes and that type of thing. But uh, I wish it would have been at the new Celtic part. No, I think that would have been much, much better, the new stadium, mm -hmm. because I, I know that Hamden wasn't the best venue for us. Uh, and uh, that was something that was overlooked in Tommy's first year as well, I think. But uh, come back to your question, uh, I think I would have stayed as a manager at Sligo uh, if it wasn't if it wasn't Celtic and wasn't Tommy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So see, when you're looking at the the players that you've come that have come through, and you you mentioned Steve McManus and John Kennedy, I remember that picture when they're both signing in the yeah, Celtic view, yeah. just the young kids. Yeah. But you come from a generation like that where the the guys that were signing you were ex Celtic players. And it, and it was a whole procession where Sean Fallon, Neely Mocking, for example, played a part in your early career. You then come through and play a, a part in John and, and Stephen's career. They're now doing the same. How important is that to a club like Celtic? I, I think it's uh, important to every club, you know, that you've got your way of working, you've got your, your you know, the passion behind it, you've got your ethos, of all the different things. Uh, but if you've if you have been a Celtic supporter or a club uh, that, that happens uh, to you, uh, it's, it's special because they're the people that you watched, mm -hmm. uh, the people you admired, you know, they were heroes and all of a sudden they don't want you to sign. So it, yeah, it is important. Uh, it's not the be end and, no, of, uh, like, what could you say, like, uh, there'll be good coaches and, and, and good recruitment officers or good managers that want you to come in that don't have the Celtic background and that's been you no know, that's happened over the years as well like you no know, Bim Jansen stopping 10 in a row that mm -hmm. type of thing yeah. uh, and like you no know, came into the club but he knew what it was, it was about and he had good support round about him you no know, Murdo and that been there as well so uh, I think it's it makes it special when you're signing for the club that you support mm -hmm. and there is that bit as well where if it is a, a hero uh, that you watch in the terraces yourself uh, like it makes it even more special yeah now you have a love affair with Sligo uh, <laughs> we've seen it coming in and out your story and you're going back how often have you gone back since you left in the early well, 90s well regular yeah with uh, the 25th anniversary uh, of winning it uh, the FAI took everybody down to the cup final uh, like a couple of years ago and it was special, all mm -hmm. the boys coming together. It was uh, fantastic. But when there was a real bond, and I think you, you know yourself, any winning team, 
it's because of not just being uh, a good football side or tactical but they, they go that extra bit for each other yep. and it's still still like that these days as, as well like uh, superb uh, I, I know that they all come back together uh, and every time I go I go to Sligo it's a common joke uh, like no I got a free pint of Guinness no it doesn't matter what pub I go into like the, the and it's it's nice uh, I've been over recently uh, you know, part of my role is to cover Ireland as well mm-hmm. for, for scouting and uh, there was a few good players in the League of Ireland uh, that we're keeping an eye on uh, so I've been to Sligo and actually Friday night I'll be at the St Pat's Sligo game uh, so I'll be doing my work then going up to to do what we have to do on Saturday night mm-hmm. so I'm hoping it's uh, like a good weekend a good weekend all round but Aye. no the Sligo was brilliant the, the people uh, like a Saturday night what triggers that made us successful were we got the floodlights in mm-hmm. uh, we decided as a club the chairman and the, the secretary that we were, weren't going to compete with uh, Premier League football being live on the TV so we took our games to like half past seven, eight o'clock on a Saturday night, and that was uh, the start of Sligo Town rocking, <laughs> if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. The, yeah. uh, the supporters would come and then we'd go to the town centre, and like uh, it was just a great, a great atmosphere. And they stuck with us uh, during we tricky spells, uh, but it's the most successful year that they've ever had, if you know what I mean. And uh, but the people make it as well. No, the because of not a success for a period of time when it did come they enjoyed it mm. uh, and like for me like going over there now uh, the stadium's improved uh, they've got uh, big ambitions about an academy and making the stable uh, the stadium all the way around mm-hmm. uh, the stand as well so fair play to them I think uh, 94 it was a long time ago but it was a trigger for virtually no, 20, 25 years success mm-hmm. staying in the top flight winning trophies now and again uh, so no, proud of what we did there but it was just a special time and a special place for us uh, and as I say the guy going back to Sean's words like I would never have been able to enjoy it even if we had success if the family wasn't there with us mm-hmm. and you no, know, Mary became like you no know, some of the boys were calling her the manager you no know, it was her that was doing the tactics and not me you know? so she became part of it as well and even with the the wives and uh, the girlfriends as well like became very pallid with them mm-hmm. so that move and they were again all in and that's what we did went all in to make it happen and it did and uh Came back, it gave Mary like uh, in terms of uh, the Brady family, which Mary's mum, uh, they were born outside the town uh, and lived just outside the town. Uh, so she had no relatives about, which helped in the initial days. And like, no, now like it obviously it's a different generation. Yeah. Uh, like, no, they basically you no know, passed away. You know, like the aunts and uncles that we have had, but the the cousins and. No, they're all in that area as well now so it'll be special to go back there yeah you know when you look at Celtic and the traditions of the club it was founded on charity there was obviously the oppression brother Walfred had this idea uh, there was other clubs in Scotland who had been set up for charitable purposes it's still at the forefront of what the club means and you're involved this weekend in the foundation's big sleep out first and foremost, have you ever done it? Have you done it at Celtic Park? No, I haven't. And uh, like, uh, it was a young, sh- I don't know if we mentioned that earlier in the conversation, but it was uh, Sean Fallon's son, Sean, that brought it to my ten- attention. He said, uh, you want to Sligo? There's, there's a charity event out there, uh, a sleep out. And I was like, right away, my mind's gone, Sligo, Celtic, will I, will I not? And before I knew it, Sean had spoke to Michael McCourt and my phone rang and they said uh, well I hear you're interested in, in going and doing a sleep out uh, and I said alright okay yeah that sounds good it sounds good uh, so everything that can they align it's like uh, it's Sligo mm-hmm. the connections there Celtic the connections uh, it's the 6th of November you know, the birth day of uh, the club uh, it's in Ballymote County Sligo uh, we're going there uh, so I went back into the house and said to Mary, like, 
I'm going to do this uh, sleep out and uh, Mary being Mary she's like that. right okay a man all going <laughs> and I, I said right brilliant that's it you're in you're in as well so again all in <laughs> and uh, it's a, a case of now like no fundraising for it mm -hmm. uh, but it's a special event I've not never done it before uh, as I said earlier I'm taking in a game on the Friday and uh, look forward to getting back up to Sligo uh, and it's for a great cause it's not to help you no know, families here in uh, Scotland and also in Ireland as well so we're hoping that uh, we can raise a considerable amount of money uh, and I said to uh, my wife as well so we've we've got two just given pages and uh, like no she's very competitive so she's wanting to get, get more money than what I've got as well for the cause uh, so we're, lo we're looking forward to it but I don't know what it's going to be like I've, I've heard uh, no, it starts at nine o'clock on mm -hmm. Saturday night. Uh, the bit of the history of the club. Uh, you know, the participants will, will all be there. Uh, I've offered to do a Q and A if the people want to get to sleep. If you know what I mean, like I can, <laughs> I can uh, help them in that one. Uh, but uh, for the the people that I've engaged with it, uh, I will do a Q and A. And as far as I'm aware, there's a well-known uh, folk singer. Uh, uh, going to be there as well, and mm -hmm. she's going to bring her guitar. So between the history of the club, a Q and A, uh, and hopefully a nice sing song uh, that will pass through the night anyway. So looking forward to it, but I'm not sure about uh, how it will be at three, four in the morning. Although I've had some of the Sligo boys on saying, "Willie, it will not be the first time you've been out, out all night <laughs> in Sligo." <laughs> so uh, the, all the Oh, the banter's good as well. So we're hoping to get uh, the support of uh, you know, the people in Sligo as well as, and we've had supporters clubs uh, you know, sending the, the donations to the, the page and some ex-players as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, brilliant. So I'm hoping all the staff will back it and friends and family, that type of thing. So at the moment, it's been a great reaction. And uh, like, you know, having us in today as well, it's great to pub you know, publicise it. And... Uh, like, uh, yeah, when you're going to do something, do it the right way and go all in, as Sean said. Go all in. Now, the links to both yourself and Mary's um, GoFundMe pages will be in the video description underneath the video. So give what you can. Yeah. Uh, Willie McStay is going to be sleeping out. And you know on a Sunday you can go into any pub and you'll get a pint of Guinness after yeah. the hard work's been done anyway, Willie. So <laughs> good on you and thank you for joining us to talk about it on a Celtic State of Mind. No, thanks for having us and uh, we'll look forward to it. And uh, the long joins are packed. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>